Ashley Carver. My name is Valerie. Um, and the program that I'm going to be presenting today is called George Washington Carver, A Man of Great Faith. So I'm going to kind of give you guys a little bit of his background, but then I'm also going to talk about how faith was involved in his life and how it had a huge impact on the man himself. The program's probably going to last uh, anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes or longer. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know as we go along. I'll be happy to answer them. All right. So it's kind of interesting. If you guys think about in our lives today, how much of an impact and how we all are looking for something and a, uh, something that we want to have a meaning in our life. And sometimes people find it in faith. They find it in other things. In George Washington Carver's case, he found it in faith. And he was actually born here on this property around 1864. This is the original 240 acres of the Moses Carver farm. This was owned by Moses and Susan. This is Moses Carver, an image that you see right here. The image on the left is of a young Moses. The Im image on the right is of an older Moses that we actually have on display downstairs. Moses actually bought George's mom, Mary, in 1855 for $700, which made her a slave for life. George was born on this property. This was where his faith started and his love for learning also started. He also had a, so you can see me. of his house that he was born in, with him and his brother, Jim. Jim is the young man that you see on the left, and here is George. His, this was where he spent about 12 years of his life was on this property, and this is kind of where his faith started. Now Moses and Susan were never, to our knowledge, was not like strong believers in like, they wouldn't go to church on a regular basis, but Moses did have family and relatives that he had buried in the cemetery that he set aside that actually has a lot of symbolisms of Christianity. There's also local folklore that says that George Washington, that Moses would open up the creeks that ran along his property for baptisms. And so as a young boy, George Washington Carver did attend some of these burials as well as probably some of these baptisms, which would have had somewhat of an impact on him, but the greatest impact for, on his faith actually came from a neighbor, from a young boy who was about his age. He was a gentleman with, with the last name of Bainham, who actually came and would play with George Washington Carver, and one Sunday morning he was talking to this young boy, and, he's, and this is the conversation that was, went on between him and this neighbor boy. He says, I was just a mere boy when I converted, hardly 10 years old. God just came into my heart one afternoon while I was alone in the loft of our big barn, while I was shelling corn to carry to the mill to be ground into meal. A dear little boy came by one Saturday morning, and in talking and playing, he told me he was going to Sunday school tomorrow. I was eager to know what Sunday school was. He said they sang hymns and prayed. I asked him what prayer was and what they said. I do not remember what he said, only remember that as soon as he left, I climbed up into the loft, knelt down by the barrel of corn, and prayed as best I could. I do not remember what I said. I only recall that I felt so good that I prayed several times before I quit. That was my simple conversion, and I have tried to keep the faith. That was when he was about 10 years old, living here on the farm. This shows you a map 
of this area, historic map of the area, you can see right here is where we are. The Bannum Farm, which is where the young boy was, and then the Lotus Grove Church, which was the very first church that he ever attended. But he would only be able to attend it on Sunday. But at the end of the Civil War, and then he, up until that point in the, of the Civil War, he was not allowed to get an education. After the war, when this happened, it would have been after the war, and he was free, and he wanted to get an education. So, in like most places in this time period, churches and schools self shared the same building. So, as a young boy, he went to Sunday school. But then he started wanting to want more and learn more. But the church would not, the school would not allow him to attend Monday through Friday. It was at that point that he packed up everything he owned and moved to Neosho, where he met Andrew and Mariah Watkins. They were the neighbor. They actually were probably the ones, Mariah Watkins was probably the one who gave him his strongest foundation in faith. It was when he moved in with them that he got to stay with them and attend school but Mariah also took him to church, and he attended the um, African Episcopal Methodist Church, as well as the Baptist Church in Neosho. And it is Mariah who gave him his very first Bible, and also encouraged him even more in his spirituality and his faith. And we actually have the very first Bible that she gave on display downstairs, which you guys can take a look at it. He said, he, he states, I lived with a family who let me attend the school. For this, I worked in their house. Indeed, Mr. and Mrs. Watkins took me in just as one of the family. One of his classmates, a Calvin Jefferson, who he attended school with, um, he describes... George is during George's school day here. He has good morals and was a good Christian and belonged to the African Methodist Church here. Calvin Jefferson also states that him and Carver went to Sunday school twice a day, both Baptist in the morning and AM in the afternoon. An example of how much his faith was established in Neosha and how he kept it as a part of his life. He spent about a year in Yosho, and then he ended up wanting to go to better schools. And he met the Seymours at Olathe, Kansas, and then eventually at Minneapolis, where he will attend the Presbyterian Church. And it's actually interesting because this church, the Presbyterian church that you see here, was also the first record that we have of him being in a set church. This is his signature at the top of this record that he joined in July of, 9, of 1883. So you can see that was his very first Presbyterian and the very first example of a church, still showing how faith remained a part of his life no matter where he went. He stayed in Minneapolis where he got his high school degree, and then he wanted to attend college. Well, the very first college he attended, they wouldn't let him attend. The very first college he tried was a faith-run school. The second time that a faith-based a faith school didn't allow him to attend school. But he didn't give up. He kept going and he kept his faith. He then ended up moving to Winterset, Iowa, where he met the Mulholland family. And it is here that we have, that he describes as one evening, I went to a white church and sat in the rear of the house. The next day, a handsome man called for me at the hotel and said his wife wanted to see me. When I reached the, the splendid residence, I was astonished to 
recognize her as the prima donna in the choir. I was most astonished when she told me that my fine voice has attracted her. I had to sing quite a number of songs or pieces for her and agree to come to her house at least once a week. And from that time till now, Mr. and Mrs. Mulholland have been my warmest and most helpful friends. He also states later on that I think of you often and shall never forget what you were to my life, how much real help and inspiration you gave me. You, of course, will never know how much you've done for a poor colored boy who is drifting here and there as a ship without a rudder. You helped this to start me aright, and what the Lord has in his kindness and wisdom permitted me to accomplish is due in a very great measure to your real, genuine Christian spirit. How I wish the world was full of such people, what a different, it, different world it would be. The Mahalans were also the ones that encouraged him to go to Simpson College, which was a Methodist-run school. This was also the first school that accepted him. That was a Christian-based school that accepted him. And he states, they made me believe I was a real human being. It is around this time that he starts to really focus and spend more time not only building even more on his faith, but also he would get up every morning at 4 a.m. and go out in the woods and talk to God. It was part of his regular ritual all throughout his life. Simpson College is where he then was encouraged by Etta Budd, who was his art teacher, to actually move on to Iowa Agricultural College because why he majored in art at this place, he didn't, Etta did not feel like he could make a good living and encouraged him to go on to Iowa State. It is at Iowa State that he started even more folk having running Bible schools, running, focusing on agriculture, and waking up every morning. He will stay at Iowa until around 1896 where he moves to Tuskegee. It is, and this is a letter that he wrote to Booker T. From, to Booker T. Washington saying, I am looking forward to a very busy, pleasant, and profitable time at your college and shall be, shall be glad to cooperate with you in doing all I can through Christ to strengthen me to, the better, to better the conditions of our people. This is, and then this is when he's, when he's in Tuskegee, he spends a lot of time not only working with science, but he also had Bible studies. He also had, this was also where he kept walking at 4 o'clock every morning, going out and talking with God, talking to the Creator. It was part of, with his love for nature, it was all part of it. He states, nature is very forms are the little windows through which God permits me to commune with him and it can see much of the, his glory, majesty, and power by simply lifting the curtain and looking in. I love to think of nature as a limited, a limited broadcasting tape station through which God speaks to us every hour, every moment of our lives, if we only tune in and remain so. And this is where he also talks about how he would wake up every morning at 4 o'clock. He will spend from 1896 until his death in 1947, living and working at or 1943, living and working at Tuskegee. Here is a picture of the Bible class, one of the Bible classes that he led at Tuskegee. He would usually present it every. It would be available every day after chapel for the students. This is what he writes to Booker T. Washington. He's like, about three months ago, six or seven persons met in my office one evening and organized a Bible class and asked me to teach it. I consented to start them off. Their idea was to put in, in the 20 or 25 minutes on Sunday evenings, which intervened between supper and chapel service. We began at the first of the Bible and attempted to explain the creation story in the light of natural and reveals religion and geological truths. Map charts, plants, geological specimens were used to illustrate the work. We have had an, uh, an, av uh, an average attendance of 80 and often as high as 114. Does these facts would help you in speaking on the religious life of the school? From the moment he started this, it lasted for about 30 years. 
He always had these school, these Bible classes that went on. This is this is another one of this would be when he would wake up in the morning. He would go out, and then it was there when he was out on one of his walks that he was encouraged to work with the peanut. And this is him back in his lab working in on different types of projects. It's like marvel, marvels how I wish I had you in God's little workshop for a while. How your soul would be thrilled and lifted up during his time at. Tuskegee, he was also encouraged to become part of, to be a speaker for um, the YMCA and the Commission of Interracial Cooperation. This was also a part where he would start traveling throughout the country and speak with groups of people all throughout the country. Now, he passed away on January 5th, 1943, at the age of 78. And he states, he stated, well, someday I will have to leave this world, and when that day comes, I want to feel that I have an excuse for have living in it. I want to feel that my life has been of some service to my fellow man. Throughout George Washington Carver's journey, he has faced one challenge after another, any challenge that could have given him to give up. But his faith in the Creator was something that he kept with him all throughout his life, and carried him through so many challenges that he was willing to keep on going. So when you talk, think of George Washington Carver, we think of the scientists, we think of the agriculturalists, but we cannot forget of the man of faith. And that is something that is a huge part of his life, has been a part of his life from the moment he was a young boy until his death. So thank you guys all so very much. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day.